consciousness. No one can say exactly what it is, how it's formed, or whether or not it's solely a human trait. But we propose that it's the foundation of all magic, and perhaps the foundation of the universe itself. Hey folks, this is James, aka Threskiornis. Welcome to our next video on Emergent Magic. We're following along with a book, Emergent Magic, Rebuilding Our Tribes Through Ritual and Meaning. And in the book, this chapter is simply called Magic. But really what it's all about is consciousness. Like many who came before us, we tried our hand at creating a definition for magic. Despite knowing full well that magic is one of those things, like religion, that is never going to be defined. But we think we did a pretty good job at defining what the process of magic is. In EMK, magic is the art of altering consciousness. That seems simple enough, but it leaves a lot of room for interpretation and speculation. If consciousness can be altered, what is normal consciousness? Who or what has consciousness? What constitutes an altered state of consciousness? How does one create an altered state of consciousness? And are all altered states created equal? It's helpful to know a little about neuroscience and two popular theories on how the brain works and what goes into our modes of thought the task positive network, and the default mode network. The task positive network is pretty simple. These are the parts of the brain that are used when focused on a task. It could be a physical or mental task, but they are oriented on a goal. The default mode network is a little trickier. Scientists have discovered that certain regions of the brain become active when a person is passively thinking when they are at rest and engaging in what can be described as daydreaming. Default mode network thinking is not goal-oriented. A person could just be remembering things or thinking about others or thinking about their future. This is a part of normal brain activity and for our purposes, when a person is engaged with the default mode network, their consciousness is not considered altered. We propose a third category of consciousness. When areas of the brain that are used for both the task positive network and the default mode network engage, and areas of the brain that normally don't have regular communication connect. We see this in studies of the brain function of people meditating and people under the influence of psychedelic substances such as LSD. What does this mean for you as a magician? It means there's a distinction between how consciousness operates when we're doing everyday tasks and activities and how it functions when it is deliberately altered. What can this altered mind do? We believe quite a lot. In fact, we believe it necessary to perceive and manipulate magical phenomena. No matter what model of magic you're engaging in, be it the energy model or the spirit model, it's of paramount importance to the psychological model, as in that model, altered states of consciousness are needed to access and program the subconscious mind. But even when you take all of this into account, the brain may not be all there is to consciousness, and we're not entirely sure where it comes from. These changes may only be occurring because the brain is the control center of our bodies. Consciousness itself may be something else entirely. The brain, as we see it, is like the controls of a car. It's the gas pedal, the brake, and the steering wheel, and consciousness is what's controlling it. Who, or what, has a consciousness that can be altered? While it may seem to be the purview of us homo sapiens, we really have no way of knowing if animals possess consciousness as well. On top of that, 
there's a growing number of neuroscientists who believe that consciousness is not solely generated in the brain, that other parts of the body can generate consciousness as well. And if we're going to go that far, maybe consciousness is not only a product of biology. From an EMK perspective, consciousness can be generated by any sufficiently complex system. What is sufficiently complex? Well, we can't say for sure, but every atom in the universe contains a swirling mass of subatomic particles, some of which seem to pop in and out of existence. This brings us full circle, showing that the animus just may have been right, that every cloud, tree, stone, a body of water may have consciousness, a consciousness that is both individual and makes up a larger whole. In the EMK book, we referred to levels of consciousness. And one change that we will make in the new edition is to remove any reference to this, as it implies that some forms of consciousness are somehow better or more advanced. And I think it's best said that there are different forms of consciousness, some of which we may have only a limited understanding of, but are not inferior or better than any other types of consciousness. One key component of consciousness is perception. It requires input as well as output. Otherwise, it's just stasis. Perception is key here, as quantum physics has proven that perception alters the state of the universe. Some of you may be familiar with the famous double slit experiment, in which particles are shot at a screen. Between the particle generator and the screen is a wall with two slits. The particles must pass through the slits in order to hit the screen and make a mark. When the particles are thrown with no one observing, they seem to pass through both openings at the same time, creating a wave pattern on the screen. A neat trick unto itself. But add a conscious observer and a funny thing happens. The particles then seem to choose one slit or the other, making their mark as individual particles on the screen. In essence, it is the presence of a conscious observer that determines what state the particles are in. This opens up a lot of possibilities. What can a person do with this information? If we believe in the principle of as above, so below, and its opposite, that if you change things on a subatomic level, you also change the macro, well, you can do anything. How do altered states of consciousness affect these things? There have been preliminary studies that seem to show that experts in meditation can change the direction in which the particles fly. This gives us, if not a fully scientific justification for magic, at least a reasonable theory on how magical acts are accomplished. Now you know me, I'm all about the history. I believe there's a lot still to be learned from the ancient practitioners of magic. However, in studying the magic of ancient peoples, one clearly sees that most believed that if you say the right words at the right time with the right material, the magic will work. I can only say that from my own experience, that this is not entirely true, that some form of altered consciousness is required for the success of magic. It is required that you practice altering consciousness and it becomes a skill that you acquire. Conversely, there's a reason why we call it an art, because there exists infinite ways to alter consciousness. And all those instructions on what to wear, what to say, what incense to burn, and where and when to do it, does alter consciousness. Anything that takes you outside those default ways of being alters consciousness. And what alters consciousness is different for everyone, because everyone has a different normal. Two things that are almost guaranteed to alter consciousness, however, are psychedelics and meditation, which is why we place so much importance on them. We find that the most effective states of altered consciousness is when a person engages in mindfulness, 
when they are fully engaged in the moment, not trying to analyze their current activity. That's when the doors of perception burst open and a magus is in a pure state of being. So I'm going to wrap this one up with a couple of things. First, this chapter of the Emergent Magic book was heavily influenced by Dr. Robert Lanza and his book, Biocentrism. I highly recommend picking that one up as he makes a convincing argument for how consciousness is the basis for everything in the universe. We may disagree on what constitutes life, but it is still a fascinating read. I'm also going to give you a direct quote from the Emergent Magic book, which I think sums up what I've been saying here nicely. Magic only works through an expression of the individual's consciousness. Even in group ritual, each individual brings their own expression to join the whole. It cannot be mass-produced or copied. Each magical act is unique. Magic must be performed with skill, intention, and with a goal of an aesthetic. Hence, magic is an art. Beauty and meaning, the two things that can never be measured, the things that can only be created and perceived by consciousness, are the essence of magic. If you jive with what we're getting at here, don't forget to like and subscribe. It also helps with the YouTube algorithm if you watch our videos through all the way to the end. Don't worry, you're almost there. So our trip to Egypt may be pushed back a little. Deposits are still paid. We're still definitely going. It just may be later than November. And we can still use your help paying for permits and better camera equipment to bring you a magician's eye view of Egypt. Go to our Ko-Fi page to donate and monthly donators will have access to scripts from most of our episodes of the show. We also have merch. See my dragonfly friend scoping out that sweet scroll of Thoth bumper sticker? You can get that along with t-shirts, journals, and other items at our Redbubble store. Thank you so very much for watching, and we'll see you next time. Oh.